Um, let me begin with just a brief overview of STEM Biosys. What we're, um, we are primarily a life science tool company built around a very unique technology that I'll spend some time talking about that. What we have done over the last few years, though, is build around that technology a very strong patent portfolio. We've built a manufacturing strategy so that we can d deliver this technology on a sustained and repeatable basis. Um, we have built a strong set of distribution partners both here in the U.S. and around the world, and we have branded our products under the Salvo name as the next evolution in cell research to give us a go-to-market strategy that we can use, and it can be all-encompassing, as you'll see as we broaden the product portfolio. We'll talk about two other things in addition to the life science tool strategy. First, we have a set of collaborations that we've been working on over the last few years, 20 plus collaborations when I added them up this morning. Um, and we'll talk about the results of three of those, uh, one in a lot of detail and two others in a little bit less detail. But to kind of give you a flavor of what those collaborations are leading to, where they're, what they're ending up and um, where we're headed with those. And in it, it related to the collaborations, that we've been pursuing some therapeutic indications. And again, one of the pieces of data I'll share with you is some more information on that. And then finally, I think everybody in this room and everybody at this conference understands you can have the best technology in the world, but if you don't have the right team around it to drive it, it won't get anywhere. And as you'll see in a few minutes, uh, we believe we put together a great team to drive the, the technology and the company forward. So, one of the challenges we always have is explaining the technology, and, and what we've concluded after years of doing this is the simplest way to explain this is to tell you how we make it at a very high level. So what we do, it's a cell expansion technology, and the way we create this is we start with cells. We put those cells in some kind of format. Right now everything is in a uh, six-wall plate or a T75 flask, T150 flask. We add media and growth factors. The cells do what cells do. They expand and they lay down an extracellular matrix. And at the conclusion of that multi-day production process, we remove the cells, we remove all the media and growth factors, and what we have left is a very natural extracellular matrix. And this is a matrix created by cells themselves. And anytime I talk to people, this is not a polymer, this is not a synthetic, this is a 100% environment that is created by cells for cells. And we can share lots and lots of data about the, the why this is a good thing. And I think if you just conceptually think about it, a natural environment for a natural product is, is probably better in most cases. This particular data came out of the Langer Anderson Labs at MIT, and what they looked at was the performance of MSCs. So you have start with our extracellular matrix, you add MSCs, you do that on a variety of substrates, and what happens? Well, when you compare our product to competing products, what you see, number one, is you get more cells, so there's more proliferation. But as my senior scientist likes to tell me, that's actually not that interesting, because I can just leave cells on whatever substrate I'm using longer. What we of more importance in our view is the fact that the matrix is delivering better cells. And we looked at a couple things here at MIT. The cells coming off the matrix are smaller, and therefore we argue more stem-like in their properties. And we, we could show you lots and lots of gene heat maps, but one of the interesting um, genetic markers we looked at is stage-specific embryonic antigen 4, which is a marker of potency. And we see significantly, consistently higher levels of SSEA4 on MSCs expanded on our matrix than on other products. One other comment I would make is that, again, the data we've had published to date has all been around MSCs. We have customers, we have collaborators who have done cardiomyocytes, they've been chondrocytes, they've done um, newt limb cells, we've done ovarian cancer cells from mice on this, and so there's, you know, what we encourage people with, if there's a cell you want to try, we're always happy to provide samples to people to see what results they get. One of the things we heard early on when we introduced our product, we used fetal bovine syrup in the, uh, serum in the production of the core product, was we really need a xenofree solution. And we spent 2017 putting together that xenofree solution. In fact, just after this conference last year, we announced our xenofree product. And the good news is we didn't have to give up a whole lot of performance. And here I'm showing cell proliferation. 
in moving to that xeno-free environment. We do have a paper coming out this quarter, I think, fourth quarter of this year, that'll give more detail on a xeno-free uh, cell culture environment, our xeno-free cell culture environment. So we can certainly, if you're interested in that, we'd be happy to share that with you when it comes out. So what I've done is kind of give you the core technology of the company. I stepped into this role just over four years ago, and one of the dilemmas you have when you have a platform technology is what are you going to do with it? And I was very fortunate to have a very highly qualified board, and we spent a fair amount of time thinking about what were we going to, what were we going to do with the company, where were we going to take this? And what we've identified is really th three streams of work that define the strategy of STEM Biosis. So first and foremost, we are going to build a life science tool company that is leveraged around our core technology. We will actively seek complementary products, both developing those internally, developing products with collaborators, and in some cases, we've looked at a couple inorganic solutions that would be bolt-on into our life science toolkit. So anything that falls within that cell culture work would be fair game for us. Second, we, uh, we recognize that the highest and best use of this product may in fact not be invented within the four walls of stem biosis. So we have had a very active collaboration program underway. We have continued that since the day I walked in the door and we're continuing to push that forward even now. And then finally, there's been some indication that the matrix itself may offer some interesting therapeutic possibilities. We are pursuing those. Um, the one thing I've insisted with my team, with my board, is that we will heavily rely on grant funding to pursue those, at least in the near term, until we have enough that we can go out and actually have enough data to go raise money around it. So that's where we're headed with that. I want to take a few slides and just talk about the life science tool strategy for a minute. About a year ago, we came to the conclusion that the matrix is great, and in fact, it's so great at producing cells, we, we concluded that it was a very natural extension for us to produce our own line of cells. So all of our cells, the adipose, the cord blood, you can see the list up there, are isolated and expanded on that very natural matrix that we produce. They've never seen anything other than a natural environment. So when you buy a vial of our cells, that's what you're getting, is, is product that's only been uh, isolated and expanded on that natural environment. Where we could do it in a xeno-free environment, we have. Um, we are currently working on one of these in particular to see if we can bring that into a xeno-free environment, and that work is underway. Uh, again, that was the first place we went as we began thinking about expanding our offering into the life science tool market. We have developed an overarching strategy under the Salvo name for a, a, the matrix. And it's interesting, I don't know if I can point this or not, but if you look all the way to the left on there, that, where it says bone marrow, that was the only product we had on the market a year ago. It was the fetal bovine serum matrix. We introduced the xeno-free version of the matrix late in the fourth quarter of last year. Every one of those cell lines came onto the market in the current calendar year. We have six additional cell lines that we've identified for launch in 2019, um, and we plan to launch our first media product by the end of the year. As we go forward, we'll build, continue to build out that product portfolio. Um, again, any, anything related to the uh, culture, culture of cells would be fair game for us to enter into. You can have that come back to, you can have a great product, but if you can't sell it, it doesn't do you any good. And what we did initially is we went out and we built a set of distribution partnerships around the world. So BWR is our partner here in the United States. Uh, we have Caltag in the UK. Funakoshi Company Limited in Japan. We have two distributors in South Korea. Uh, we are about to announce a distribution agreement in Australia. And yesterday morning, I signed the distribution agreement uh, with Biozol in Germany. So they'll be covering Germany, Switzerland, and Austria for us. So that, again, we've got a, a really nice global footprint. The green countries on there are markets where VWR has a presence. We don't have an agreement in place with them today, but certainly one could foresee that at some point we, uh, we may. One of the questions, uh, Bob Langer is on our board, at, and uh, Bob asked initially, one of the first questions he asked, he said, okay, I see what it is, and, and it's, it's great, but how do you know that the next batch you're gonna make is gonna do the same thing? And so we spent a lot of time uh, doing everything that needed to be done to create an automated routine manufacturing process around this. And we had, were fortunate to have a partner in San Antonio, BioBridge Global, their GenCure business, 
uh, partnered with us to build out a 1,000 square foot manufacturing suite. Um, again, it's about 10 minutes from our, our uh, corporate offices. And what we've seen, and we monitor this a lot, is that batch to batch, donor to donor variability is actually quite small on our matrix. And in fact, if you look at that graph in the upper right hand side, the blue dots are cell expansion time on tissue culture plastic, and the red dots are cell expansion time, uh, doubling time on our matrix. And you can see that regardless of how the cell behaves on the tissue culture plastic, it's consistently better on our matrix, and it's consistently consistent on our matrix. One other comment uh, on, the, uh, on this, the patent portfolio has been a real area of focus for us. When we out licensed this technolo technology from the University of Texas system, we had three pending patents. Today we have 11 issued patents. It says 12 to 15 pending patents, so that should be 13 to 16 because we filed one this morning. So um, we uh, are pursuing patents around the world and this is a very active uh, place for us to work. So that's the life science tool piece. I'm going to talk now about a couple um, collaborations that we've done. This particular work was done with Rutgers University, um, and we were looking at using our bone marrow matrix to expand chondrocytes. And obviously, there would be a potential, one could think of an autologous application, it could be an allogeneic application of producing chondrocytes, for example, for cartilage repair in knees. Um, and what we did is we started with tissue culture plastic and we got some results from that. And then we took our core bone marrow matrix product and we got some data from that. And then we actually created for Rutgers a, a matrix that was derived from chondrocytes themselves. And I don't think anybody in this room will be surprised to learn as you look at this data that first of all, if you look at the, the imaging of the matrix itself, you have more collagen two on cells, chondrocytes that are expanded on the chondrocyte matrix. It's their natural home. They, they behave and respond uh, to it. And in fact, when we look at cells on our salvo bone marrow matrix and, and chondrocytes on, our, on the chondrocyte matrix, we see higher levels of increase in total numbers of cells, and we see that happening faster. So in terms of the efficiency of the matrix for producing chondrocytes, uh, that's also improved. So you get better chondrocytes, and you get them faster. Um, so this is an area we're quite interested in. We have an NIH grant in process on this, and we have a uh, paper that's just been uh, approved for publication that should be out again this quarter, maybe early next year. And again, if you're interested in that, we'd be happy to share that with you. Two other collaborations I can talk slightly less about just because of where we are in the IP process with them, but both of them are, I think, kind of interesting case studies. The first is a drug screening application where we have partnered with a major um, research institution and identified that this, a, a new version of our matrix where the patent got filed this morning on it, um, may offer some very interesting drug screening toxi uh, toxicity testing applications. And so stay tuned on that. Uh, we're currently working through a number of things related to that, but I suspect uh, certainly by the time of J.P. Morgan in January, we'll, we'll be in a position to talk more about that. The second one, uh, we are doing work with another leading academic institution looking at matrix-bound vesicles and exosomes. And what we have done is we've looked at matrix-bound vesicles that are bound in our matrix. And we've compared those to the exosomes that are present in the media from, uh, that we use in our matrix and found that they actually behave differently. They perform differently. So the initial results are different. We're currently having that institution conduct RNA analysis for us to look at uh, whether or not there's actually a difference between those at, at the RNA level. So again, stay tuned on that one. Um, I said, you know, you can't do this without a great team. We are very fortunate to have Kathy Berzig as our chairman. Um, many, some of you may know Kathy or know of Kathy. Her last position was as the CEO of KCI. She led its acquisition by Apex Partners uh, back in 2012. Prior to that, uh, Kathy ran Applied Biosystems, which is now part of Thermo Fisher. Uh, she was in the Bay Area when she ran that. Um, we have several members from the San Antonio, both the biomedical community as well as the business community. We have two members from our lead venture fund, Targeted Technology Partners. And then from a scientific standpoint, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Robert Langer from MIT, who has been an invaluable resource to the rest of the board in terms of thinking about our matrix as a biomaterial and what the applications of that might look like. 
to, to you know, wrap up and conclude, what we believe we have is a, is a uh, technology that a leading edge area of regenerative medicine. We've got the agreements in place, distribution agreements, the patent portfolio in place, the partnerships in place to prosecute this as a life science tool. We have collaborations in place to help us realize the full potential of this. Um, and I think we've got the right team to drive this forward. So with that, I will conclude, and I thank you all for your attention, and uh, we're around. If anybody has questions afterwards, we'd be happy to discuss them with you. Thank you.